Can't beat them in a straight fight. So what can we do? The Night King made them all. They follow his command. If he falls... What's up YouTube? Welcome to the channel. My name's Anton and today we are going to be breaking down and reviewing Game of Thrones Season 8 Episode 2. Now this was a little bit of a mixed review as some didn't like it. I loved it personally but we'll get into that later. As usual if you like the video make sure you like, subscribe, and comment. Okay the very first scene is it starts with Jamie's trial. Now this went kind of according to what I expected and I'm sure th the same for many of you. As I really didn't expect Jamie to get that much of a well welcomed. To be honest with you, I, I was slightly surprised it wasn't worse. Um, one thing I really was surprised about was the person who seemed the maddest at Jamie, and that was Danny. I was really certain that John and Sansa and Arya would have been the maddest. I mean, we all know Bran's like his low key self, so I wasn't thinking we were going to get too much of a reaction from Bran. But with that being said, Danny was just really, really upset. Now, I, I don't get me wrong; she has all the right to be upset. He did kill her father, but with everything that we know about Danny's father and everything she knows about Danny's father, it is a little bit surprising that she is so, like, bothered by it. I guess. Next up, I noticed the way Tyrion reacted when he found out Cersei was not bringing her army north. Now this was kind of a relief to me because like many of you, I kind of thought Tyrion was plotting against Danny with Cersei from the scene last season, I think it was the season finale. Um, now don't get me wrong, something went on during this scene that you're looking at now. He definitely, there's something going on. He's not off the hook, but maybe it's just something, I don't know, stupid, like he's in love with her. I don't see that, but it could be. All I know is I'm just relieved he's not on Cersei's side. I'm sorry for what I did to you. You weren't sorry then. You were protecting your family. I'm not that person anymore. You still would be. If you hadn't pushed me out of that window, and I would still be Brandon Stark. You're not? No. I'm something else now. You're not angry at me? I'm not angry at anyone. Why didn't you tell them? You won't be able to help us in this fight if I let them murder you first. Okay, next up, I just wanted to show you guys this clip just to show you what I was talking about. I completely loved every interaction that Jamie and Bran had. I don't know if it's just the nostalgia from seeing where everybody came from or just... I don't know what it is. I think Bran plays the character perfectly and they just have a chemistry and you just sense and feel the guilt that Jamie has weighing on him about Bran. I mean, it's amazing. What about afterwards? How do you know there is an afterwards? Alright guys, now this leads to my next theory. I'm the first one when I think that I found something that I stick to it and proclaim like I, I'm the one who thought of this. But that goes both ways and when those things are wrong I'll also be the first person to admit when I was wrong and I was I feel like I was wrong. Now I could be wrong about my theory about my theory being wrong <laughs> if that makes any sense but we'll see I guess next episode I was amongst some of the people that was completely certain Jamie Lannister was gonna die in episode 3 of the season uh, this episode has completely changed my mind on that as that little last part with Bran everyone thinks that's Bran's way of telling him he's gonna die I just George R. R. Martin is slick and the writers are slick I think that's the, his way of saying they're foreshadowing his survival, actually. Okay, I'll be the first to admit that I hated Sansa through most of the series. In the last two episodes, she's really impressed me. Um, 
she's very intelligent and she's just learned from everything and she kind of said it both best she's a slow learner but she does learn and it, you can definitely tell she has grown from a little girl to be the strong independent woman that she is now i mean i loved the way she just like told the nearest like yeah you you shouldn't have trust her either like <laughs> Stop blaming Tyrion for everything. She's standing up for herself. Now, there's a couple of characters' deaths that I kind of seen foreshadowed in, the, in this episode, and we'll go through some of them. I've already went through a couple of them, but this one is pretty clear to me that Theon Greyjoy will not survive past episode three. I just am the probably the most confident about this one as any of the other ones. He's just, I feel like he's destined to die in Winterfell it's his redemption arc and that's the only way that he can really redeem himself is he believes he was truly a Stark at heart and he has to die defending his home because Winterfell is his home okay next they're just in the war room and they're discussing the strategies and tactics I kind of thought this was interesting because we finally get to learn a little bit more about the Night King in this scene and that's just Bran talking and telling us about how the Night King wants an endless night. And he is trying to destroy the Three-Eyed Ravens to destroy the memory of mankind. Now that's interesting to me, but I think there's more to the Night King than that. And I think we'll find that out next episode. But I do believe this is the best chance. That is the plan that they came up with. And that's just isolate Bran in the God's Wood and wait for the Night King to come to him and try to kill the Night King to destroy all the other army. That's the best thing they've got. But what no one's talking about is that they have undead giants. Yeah, so I think they need to talk about that as well. <laughs> like, what the fuck are you guys going to do about the giants? Oh, and the dragon. Okay, so next up I want to talk about Brienne. And I was a firm believer Brienne was going to survive until last night. Now let me explain this a little bit. When they showed that Brienne got knighted, I just felt like that fulfilled everything she ever wanted to do in life, and that was a foreshadow that she was going to die. Next up, we have Jorah. I think he's going to die. That scene was foreshadowed when he was get talking to Lady Mormont, and Sam came up and gave him his sword. Another one, this one's hard, is Grey Worm. I don't think Grey Worm is going to survive. I think that was scene was a precursor and foreshadow of his death as well. Okay, now I was going to get to this eventually, so here it is. This image is what most of us see when we talk about Arya. So that's why everyone was a little bit freaked out when all of a sudden they just go straight grown Arya having sex. I mean, I, it's funny to me though. People are like, oh my god, she can't have sex with him. But it's okay, you can just murder a bunch of people and feed them to their father. That's fine, just don't have sex. <laughs> Then again, we can't be too surprised at this because this was kind of foreshadowed to us all the way back in Season 1, Episode 1, when King Robert said that they should join their houses with his son and Ned's daughter. So, it's full circle. I think this is how House Baratheon and how Stark's name will continue. Is that going to talk Who told you this? Bron. He saw it. He saw it? And Samwell confirmed it. He read about their marriage at the Citadel without even knowing what it meant. A secret no one in the world knew. Except your brother and your best friend. Doesn't seem strange to you? It's true, Danny. I know it is. If it were true, it would make you the last male heir of House Targaryen. You'd have a claim to the Iron Throne. Wow, this is a pretty awesome scene to me. Uh, we've been waiting for this for, at least I have, for about four seasons now. And it finally, 
it finally hit her face first and she seemed like she was not concerned at all with the fact that she just screwed her nephew multiple times. That didn't seem to bother her at all. The only thing that bothered that woman was that he has a claim to the Iron Throne, which should kind of let John know all he needs to know about the kind of queen she will be right there. Just saying. What are you guys' thoughts? Do you think Danny should rule, or do you think John should rule, or do you think someone else? All right, guys, last thing to talk about this episode, and this is more of a question than anything, so I would love to get all of your guys' feedback and opinions, so make sure you comment below on what your thoughts are. Now, when the White Walker army came up on Winterfell's gates, I noticed that the whole first row looked like they were all White Walkers. Now, we know that, well, we don't know. A lot of people think that there's only 13 White Walkers, but John... Sam and Mira have already killed one, so that leaves 10 based on that theory. But it looked like there was a lot more than 10 White Walkers in that front line alone, not including the Night King. So what do you guys think? How many White Walkers are there? All right, guys, that's going to wrap it up for this episode. I know there's some things that I left out, like Jenny's song, and I was going to make a video on its own about that. So if you're interested in that, make sure you subscribe to the channel and stay tuned. thing we can do now is look the truth in the face. The Night King is coming. The dead are already here. Start your prayer! Thank <laughs> you.